I, I do hope that, um, you know, what the Lord's put on my heart, I'll communicate to you in a way that will be a help to you this morning. I, I always know that when I preach, God first speaks to me, and, um, you know, He's always working on us, isn't He? He's always working on us. He's always got something to talk to us about, you know? I woke up this morning singing a song about God still speaks, and I'm so glad He still speaks. I'm so glad that my God's not dead today. I don't have to go read something written by man to, you know, sort of encourage me or inspire me. I, I, I'm just glad that God is still a God that speaks. I really believe that we need to hear His voice even more today than we did in the past. I mean, it's always been important to listen to God, but when things get scary and things get rough and things get trying, as it is, seems to be more and more every day, and especially as you get older in life and this world gets more and more wicked and Buddy, we're, we really, really need to know what God is, is working on us about. And I hope we do something about what, he, what He's talking to us about. We don't just say, ah, oh, that's nice. That's nice. Amen. So I do pray the Lord will give you something today as we get into our message. Beginning in Genesis here this morning, Genesis 13. My message primarily is not going to be on Lot, even though we will touch base a couple of times about his life. I want to say very clearly that there is a problem and uh, has been a problem since the Garden of Eden. And it's a three-letter word, uh, three word, little word called sin. And sin will be something that if you do not learn how to deal with, it's going to deal with you. You know, we, we've got a humanistic viewpoint today that we need to be very careful of uh, that's permeating our culture, and that is man is basically good. We've got songs being sung on the radio about people that are innocent, they were born that way, and they're still that way. In other words, whatever they do, it's okay. Um, you know, songs I can just think of in my mind of years past where basically I'm doing my own thing, nobody's going to tell me what to do, nobody's going to tell me I'm right and wrong. But you know, sin has always been a problem, and God deals with man's problems. If you don't believe that, He went to the cross for a reason. Sin was important enough, and I should say, was a big enough deal with God that He said, I'm going to the cross to pay for it, so that I not only pay, get rid of the, the penalty of that sin, which was death, because that's what man deserved when he sinned in the Garden of Eden. He said, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. But He also went to the cross to take away the power of sin. Now, Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Now, if I know Jesus today as my Savior, that means I am free to live a life that is pleasing to Him. As a sinner, you can't do that. As a saint of God, you can do that. As a sinner, you're bound by sin. As a saint, you're free from sin. As a sinner, you are still in your sin. As a saint, you are out of sin. You're brought out of sin. He separates you from sin. And um, we're going to look at three things here just quickly about this contrast. But when you talk about sinners and saints, there aren't really any things that really agree. In fact, you're going to find out they're diametrically opposed. And, um, you know, the Bible is pretty clear about black and white issues. Have you sensed that we're living in a vague time where people are just like, eh, you know, I mean, if it's right to you, then it's right. And if it's wrong to you, it's wrong. That's called relative truth. That's more humanistic philosophy. Um, basically, you know, if it's truth to you, if you believe that, then that's truth. If you think that's wrong, then that's wrong. But I don't believe it's wrong, so therefore it's not wrong. Is that going on today? In fact, the Bible tells us it would come to a point, like in the book of Isaiah, when God brought judgment on that nation, He said, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil. So not only is there a blurring, but there's a complete opposing to where what we believe to be right and wrong, they believe the complete opposite. I remember seeing somebody in a very prominent position in our country, and every time I heard him speak, I always thought, whatever is righteous, whatever is good, whatever is holy, he's going to do the complete opposite of what it needs to be said right and what a real standard of right and wrong is. He's always going to be completely wrong. And I'll tell you why. Because he was a sinner exceedingly. Look at Genesis 13 here just for a moment. 
And uh, we're going to look at the word sinner, first of all, in the Bible. And then we're going to look at the word saint very briefly at the end. And I'm going to try to draw this together just, just for a little bit of understanding for us. And we're going to look at the life of sinners. Look at the definition of what the Bible calls sin and, and what a sinner is. And then we're going to try to draw from that and, and ask ourselves, what am I? Am I a sinner or a saint? And, um, you know, how am I to live my life as a sinner or a saint? And I know you know all of these things today, but I'm going to look at it just maybe from a different perspective. And hopefully we can see sin like God sees sin. Because if we can get to that point in our minds of how God sees things, then sin will bother us like sin bothers God. And uh, we'll want to please the Lord and live righteously. Look at Genesis 13 here. It says verse number 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Let's bow our heads one more time. Father, thank you this morning for the message of the Word of God. Thank you for the truth that we read, Lord. Thank you for what you put on my heart. And God, I pray that you will do what we cannot. Lord, I thank you that you stand in this place, that uh, these people, Lord, they've come to look from you and to hear from you. And God, I pray that you not use me to direct them today, but the Holy Spirit would speak to their hearts and do a work that I cannot do. God, I thank you for each person here, whether young or old. And Lord, I pray that all of us would make a commitment here today to be saints, to live a godly life that would honor you and not be a sinner. Lord, if there's a sinner here today that's not saved, I pray they'll say, Lord, I want to be your child. I want to be saved. I want to be set free and uh, then know that I'm blessed of God and not, not waiting the judgment of God, but Lord, delivered from that. And Father, we thank you for the day you did that in our lives, if we're born again here in this place, that we know we're, we belong to you. Now, Lord, help us to live that way the last few days we have here on earth, because the truth is, we're not promised tomorrow you could return today, and may we be found as saints and not sinners when you come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. New churches, new philosophy, new books, new pragmatic teaching. And uh, they'll tell you, basically, the paradigm is shifting in the church. You want to grow a big church, you've just minimized sin. Don't uh, separate. Don't call certain things wrong. Don't uh, point out people's sin. Don't do things. Don't say things that makes people feel uncomfortable. But that's not the God of the Bible. And that's not what our Bible teaches. The Bible tells us here, written by the Holy Spirit, the men of Sodom were what? Wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. You know, before man, people look pretty good, but not from God's eyes. And um, people, I was asked the other week, are you a homophobe? No, I'm not scared of homosexuals at all. I want them to get saved. Sodomites, I, I, I don't hate sodomites. I, I love those people. I want to see them get born again, just like every person in this world. I don't believe their sin is greater necessarily. The Bible does say it's sinners exceedingly, but I believe they need to be saved from that sin just as somebody who stole $5 from their mother's piggy bank. Amen. But the Bible does say that it's a sin that was exceedingly sinful and wicked. God's definition is not ever going to change about what sin is in this area. Just think about that. God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. How do you do that with Adam and Steve? You can't do that. And so we find in the Bible that God tells us here that this is exceedingly sinful. I'm going to stand on this position. And Christian, you know, neutral is the same as saying it's not wrong. Right. I want to let you know that. And we're living in a time where people say, don't offend anybody. Well, I'm glad God offended me before I got saved. I'm glad I was scared to death and I thought I was going to hell. I'm glad for that. That's what caused my heart to say yes to Jesus and a need to be forgiven. How are they going to know they need to be forgiven if they have not broken God's law, if they have not sinned, if they do not realize they have angered a holy God and put their fist in His face? How are they going to know that? They say, you're being unloving. It's unloving to tell them God loves them just the way they are and all dogs go to heaven. That's unloving. Okay? And um, don't do not embrace the passivism that is coming to Christianity. We are to be vigilant for souls. And that means we might offend someone by telling them the truth. 
But God be praised if one sinner who becomes a saint walks up to us in heaven and says, you made me upset, you bothered me, you angered me, but you told me the truth and I got saved as a result of it. Rather than a thousand people in hell screaming, that Christian was so nice, why didn't he tell me the truth instead? You see the reality of that today? So it would make sense. Satan would want to, you know, get our mouths to stop. But let's look at something here for a minute and see Psalm 51, and then we'll go through our Bible. Let's look at a couple verses here on sinners. Sinners. It's in the Bible. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 13. When David sinned against God and he got his heart right with the Lord, he says in verse 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. People need to be changed. People need to be changed. And uh, only God can do that. And people today that are in this state of being a sinner, listen, can only be changed by the grace of God. Uh, there, are ch- there are schools, and listen, I understand there's bullying and there's, and there's bad things. Some of these kids are raised in terrible homes. They're not raised in Christian homes. They don't know what love is. They've seen abuse and, and terrible things and drugs and alcohol. I understand that. But, you know, telling that, per- that young child he's a good kid and there's nothing wrong with him, And he's great and he's wonderful. And all of this, uh, what they call positive affirmation, is not going to help somebody get saved. They need to see that they have sinned against God and they need to be saved. It's very important. And you could say that in a loving way. We were out on the streets Monday night, cute little boys, cute kids running around, 13, 14 of them running around. You know, you can love those kids and still tell them Jesus saves and tell them they need to be born again and tell them about sin. You can still talk to them and let them know that you love them. And we need to do that. Jesus said in Luke 13, look here, Luke 13. By the way, what happens when you tell someone they're a sinner or that God does not agree with what they're doing or that it's wrong? Buddy, it gets uncomfortable. Pastor Grove used to call it a gospel bomb. Someone who is living a sinful life ought not be comfortable around us. I didn't say that we're not their friends, that they don't know that we love them, that we, they don't know we're, we, we, we want to, you know, the best for them and we want them to be saved. But when sinners are acting sinful around us, they should feel uncomfortable. When they curse God's name, something should say to them, man, I shouldn't say that in front of this person that is blessing and, and honoring that name all day. When somebody gets ready to tell a dirty joke, they should say to us, You might want to walk away. You know why? Because you walked away last time. Luke 13, verse number 2, Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay or no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem, I tell you nay, no, but except you repent, you ye all shall likewise perish. So the idea here is that Jesus named sin and he called people sinners. And oftentimes the message that we've heard, you know, God loves sinners but hates the sin. We need to understand that those sinners have angered God and God calls them sinful. In fact, he said they were exceedingly sinful and wicked there in the verse that we just read, didn't he? Go with me, if you would, please, to Psalm number 1. Psalm number 1. And we'll see something there. Psalm number 1. These are great verses to memorize. Six verses. It'll take you about two or three hours if you really want to do it. This is very important. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And I'm going to develop something here for a moment. What is the definition of sinfulness? Or what is the definition of a sinner? What is the definition of sin? Now, the Bible says sin is a transgression of the law. It's like saying there's a sign. When we were kids, we trespassed. There were two ponds we could fish, and they were great fishing ponds, but we weren't catching anything because we were fishing in the middle of the day, but we're dumb kids. We don't know any better. So my neighbor says to me, hey, let's go up to that pond. I bet there's fish in there. And there was the fence, and there was the sign, no trespassing. So like three dumb boys in the middle of the day, we climbed through the fence, 
and we start fishing, and no sooner the lines hit the water, this guy come out yelling, screaming, and we're hightailing it out of there, and we're running. You know what? We thought we'd get away with it, that we could trespass, that we could transgress, that we could go beyond the rules that were set. But he saw us. And you know what? It wasn't like, hi, boys. So glad you didn't listen to the message of the sign that I gave you and declared where you were allowed to be and where you weren't allowed to be. Have a great day fishing in my pond. No, he was running after us. And in fact, in the old days, it's not uncommon that people would shoot shotguns at people when they trespassed because he's the landowner and he sets the rules and he gives the permission and he sets the boundaries. Are you with me here? That's a common thing we understand. How much greater a God in heaven that says, this is right, this is wrong. This is the line. Don't go beyond the line. If you do, yes, I love you. I'll be merciful to you, but I don't think it's going to be any small deal when you break my law. And he has every right. And and understand, God's anger against sinfulness and wickedness is not like what we see in mankind. He is righteous and holy, and he demands righteousness and holiness. It's not like the anger that we've seen in the wrong sense in our lives that God has towards sin. But the Bible tells us here in Psalm number one, he says, "Nor walk, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse number 5 says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You're going to find when we find the word sinner, we're also going to find the word ungodly in the same verse. So the definition of someone who is a sinner is one that's living ungodly. Now, can I say... Praise be to the Lord that there's probably been a change in your life since you've been saved. I I hope you're less ungodly than you used to be. And I hope that the longer you're saved, the more godliness is coming forth from your life and the less ungodliness. So I want to say this very quickly. I am saved June 1998, and because of that, I will always be a saint of God. But those who have been in my family and those that know me since I've been saved, and even especially right after I got saved, they would have not always said, well, there was a real godly man. And even this year, there's been things in my life that necessarily have not been always godliness. But positionally, listen, I am a saint because of what Jesus did. Now stay with me. That's the first point I want to say. If you're a sinner today, you've never been saved. You are in a position of judgment and wrath with God. He's not going to look at you and say you're good enough to get to heaven. You've done well enough to get to heaven. You must be born again. You are either in Christ or out of Christ. You're either saved or unsaved. You're a believer or an unbeliever. You are either godly in Him or you are ungodly because you've never been saved and Christ is not in your heart. And believe me, since you, when you get saved the rest of your life, you figure out, and I'm saved by the grace of God and the only reason He's going to let me into heaven is because Jesus came into my heart. He reminds us of that over and over and over again. That's, pra- that's the positional understanding of godliness or righteousness. But on the practical sense is where the struggle begins in our life. I'm a saint, but we forget we can still live a sinful life. I want you to see that here just for a moment as we read our Bible. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2 for a moment. Now remember, we read here in Psalm 1, the one that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, the one who does not stand in the way of sinners, the one that does not sit in the seat of the scornful, which is to say the ones that are cursing God, the ones that are mocking God, the ones that are scoffing at God's word. God says, don't you keep company with them. People always say, how do you know the line of, of what you are to do? I mean, obviously, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? We're saved out of the world, and God calls us to go back into the world. So at what point do we say, I have to be in the world, I have to be witnessing them, I have to be sharing the love of Christ with them, but at what point do I say, I can't go past this certain line? Here's where it is. It's ungodliness. Where there is ungodliness, we must separate. This is important to understand this. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 8, the story of a man named Lot. Now, if you know the story back in Abraham, in the book of Genesis, Lot separated himself and Abraham separated himself from one another. 
And Lot chose the best plains, the well-watered plains, what could be good for his cattle. But the Bible tells us something specific in Lot's life that he very much messed up. In Genesis 13, the Bible says, in verse 12, Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now watch. I want to talk to you about, just for a moment, on the practical sense of being a saint or being a sinner. The practical sense. 2 Peter chapter 2. And I want to show you one of the most confusing verses in the Bible. And if it wouldn't be for God telling us that Lot was a righteous man or a saint because he believed in the covenant promise of God. He had, he, had, he had understood that Jesus would come or that there had to be a sacrifice for his sins. All of us, when studying the book of, of Genesis and the life of Lot, we would have said, that man's lost. There's not a doubt in my mind. But look what God says about this man. It says in verse number 6, again, talking about ungodliness. Look at verse 5. Spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of what? the ungodly, the sinners, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that it after should live what? Sinners, exceedingly. So people say, well, what, what, what do you think you know, about this sin of, of sodomy? Well, let's read the Bible. God says this is an example here of those which should live ungodly. Verse 7, And delivered just Lot, which we, we read the story there, angels pulled him out of the city because he didn't have a enough of a Christian heart to get himself out of the city. He vexed, he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with what? Their unlawful deeds. And then the next verse goes on to say, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. We need to understand that God puts sinners in a group of those that are under the judgment of God. As saints, we are not to participate. We are not to go along with. We are not to stand beside. We are not to support what is going on that God hates. Why? Because our job is to propagate, not to participate. And do you know, as a saint, you could participate in sinfulness and ungodliness? But man, that's a bad position to be in when Jesus comes. Because positionally, you'll be saved just like Lot. And Lot got out, and God delivered Lot, but he lost everything that he had in his life because he was righteous positionally, but he wasn't righteous practically. Please don't miss that today. Are you a sinner or are you a saint? How much will this affect our thinking when we deal with things and decisions of what to do with the rest of our lives for the Lord? I'm a saint. I need to be living like a saint. I need to be acting like a saint. I need to be talking like a saint. If your friends don't know you're a Christian, something is wrong today. If someone gets saved and they say to you, hey, I got saved, I want to tell you about Jesus and how to get born again, and you say to them, actually, I've been saved for a long time. Something's wrong in your life today. Amen. And I'm not preaching our righteousness here. I'm telling you that God wants us to live like we're saints and not sinners. We should not be able to be like Lot, who looked at those wicked men whom he lived with in that city and said, brethren, bro, brother, which is to say he was so close with sinners that he felt comfortable and they felt comfortable with him to where the sin they did didn't bother him and the sin they did, it, it just, that, that's, a, that's a real shame, friend. And you know, the world today, again, is undermining and, you know, grow your hair out, go to the bar, play the ungodly music, do everything the world's doing so that we can reach them for Christ. That's hogwash. Nobody ever got saved by someone being like the world. The only one I could think of is that one China missionary who grew his hair long like the Chinese people because he wanted to be accepted with them. I believe that was Hudson Taylor. That's the only thing I could think of that would be questionable. Separate from sinners, all right? You know, God doesn't ask us to do anything that he didn't do either. I want to remind you that the Bible says when Jesus was betrayed, 
He said, I must be delivered into the hand of sinners. Do you see the sense of what the scriptures tell to us today? Why would we want to be known or to be seen as sinners? People who are living in sins, people that are living ungodly lives. These were the people who crucified Jesus. Romans chapter 1 tells us that they were haters of God. We are not to participate. God has called us to be his witnesses and propagate the gospel in this world. 2 Corinthians 6.14 we're not to laugh at their dirty joke. Now, I want to say something here, and I'm hoping I can get to it. I have time. You still have an old nature, an old sinful nature, when you got saved. That's the one that still wants to do wrong. That's the one that still wants to be wrong. The Bible says, though, in 2 Corinthians 6.14, And what agreement hath the temple of God? That's God is living in us. We're His temple. With idols, for you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's often been said we can't avoid running into sinners, but we sure can avoid running with them. They'll mess our lives up, and before you know it, you'll be doing the same thing they're doing. You'll be laughing at the same things they're laughing at. You'll be saying the words that they're saying. You're participating in the things they're doing. And you have no more testimony. He says, verse number 17, Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. I've said this before, and I'll preach it till the day I die. Every child has some appearance that their father or mother can be seen in them today. It's such a joy to look into the children that we have in our church here today. And you can look at them and say, I see your mother's eyes. I see your father's face. I see, you know, we could see them, can't we? And yet, as Christians, should we not have an appearance of our heavenly father? Should we not bear the image of the holy if we are his? He wants us to be holy. We are his representatives. We are his ambassadors to do God a dishonor. I say it this way, our looks or our appearance should be godliness. People say, why, why do women wear dresses? Because it looks godly. It looks pleasant. It looks holy. The truth is, there's a lot of clothes you can wear every day. Nobody will ever know you're even a Christian. And I'm not saying that if you make wear something, it makes you more holy than not wearing something. But you'll understand that when you start considering the matter of dress, it's not a matter of what you put on. It's a matter of what's in here in your heart. You want to honor the Lord with your life. You want people to know you're Christian and separate from this world. You want to be modest, as the Bible says. It's a matter of the heart. And I don't know the standard of that necessarily, that we could put it in a box. But as I say, and I've said before, God will never say to us from heaven, you were too holy. You were too godly. You took too many steps to be separate from the world. I'm sure we'll hear the other when we're judged. You could have done more. You could have honored me more. Something else is our love. Our love needs to be different than the world. The things that make us excited, the things that we joy over, should be over godliness and not ungodliness. When they're excited about sin, we should be grieved over sin. When they are praising sinners, we should be warning them of the judgment to come. And also, our lips, our attitude, our language, it should be right, it should be clean, it should be pure, it should be holy. Can I remind you, are you a sinner or are you a saint today? The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, and I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. A church means a local called out assembly of saints. Psalm 89, verse 7, please. Psalm 89, verse 7. And I'm going to tell you something. The world sees whether we are living godly or ungodly. The world knows if we are. And, and it's amazing too. If you want to do what's right and you start living a life of sinfulness, the first thing sinners are going to say is, I thought you were a Christian. Why are you doing that? Why are you saying that? I thought you said you were a Christian. Why do you talk like that? Why are you looking at that? 
I thought you were a Christian. And that's pretty convicting when the world has to tell us what's right and wrong. But they know. And that, that'll do a work in your heart when, you, when the world starts. Or you have to stop your message and just blend in and act like nothing happened in your life and stop telling people about the Christ that's in your heart. And that would be Lot's condition. Positionally, he was righteous. He was a saint. But practically, he lived as a sinner every day of his life. Now, what a wasted life. What a wasted life. Psalm 89, verse 7 says, Notice here the congregation, the idea of an assembly of people. God is greatly to be feared in what? The assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about Him. We should always honor the Lord with the things we say and the things that we do. Psalm 50, verse 5 says the Lord to love the Lord. Psalm 31, verse 23, He said, Oh, love the Lord, all ye His saints. It's very important. Romans chapter 7, very quickly here. Romans chapter 7, we're just about out of time. I want to hit something. And I want to, I want to make some practical application. I would encourage you, if you've saved or just recently saved, to read the book of Romans, particularly for, uh, chapters number 6 and chapter number 7 and 8. You say, why? Because it explains that there's two people fighting within you. And here's how it works. If you seek to please the flesh, the flesh will never be happy and the Spirit of God and the new man will always be grieved. But if you seek to please the Lord and honor the new man and do what's right and live as a saint, that sinner will die. It, every day it will be crucified. All right, And we have to make a choice every day in our life. I mean, think about it. Brother, if if every one of us left this church this week and when faced with sin would say, I'm a sinner or I'm a saint, would that change the reality of how we live our life day by day and moment by moment? As we're watching television, as we're listening to the radio, as we're going along in this world, rubbing elbows with sinners, I'm a sinner. Or I'm a saint. And if we could apply what I'm preaching today, this world would be turned upside down. And you know it and I know it. Because the problem with this world today is not that Sodom and Sodomites are exceedingly sinful and wicked. The problem with this world today is us. Somebody tell me I'm wrong. Us, Christians. We're saints living like sinners in this world. That's why the world's not convicted, and that's not why the world hasn't been turned upside down by you and me. Because we participate, and we go along with, and we sound like them, and we look like them, and we act like them, and they're not convicted. But oh my, we should be today. Am I a sinner or a saint? If you're lost today, you're still a sinner positionally. If you're saved today positionally, you're a saint, but practically you might not be living that way. How important is that to the world, that the world sees Christ in us? Well, according to Romans chapter 7, Paul says here, look at very quickly, I just want to, the whole chapter is about this struggle going on in his life. You know what he was saying? I'm a sinner or I'm a saint. And he began to separate it and realize, you know, this fighting and this struggle that's going on for me to want to do wrong. Every time I give in to what I want to do wrong, I'm grieving God, and it doesn't really make me happy. And he's talking about this struggle. He says in verse 19, just, just watch this, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I, the saint, do that which I would not, being sinful, it is no more I that do it, the new saint, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I, the saint, would do good, evil is present with me, the sinner, the old man. For I delight in the law of God after what? The inward man, the new man, the new creature in Christ. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Watch, be all things, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. 
So the changing, an inward change resulting in an outward change. And still yet Paul, the man whom God used for 30 years to literally convert the whole world to Christ, said, there's still two people fighting in the practical sense every day in my life, the sinful one and the saintly one. Verse number 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But verse 23, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Members, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And sometimes people get a little mixed up because they're like, well, why am I, if I'm saved, do I still have this desire to sin? Because that's the old man. That never is changed. It's the new man that came alive that is the change in you in Christ. So you have to learn how to say no to that man. I'm not that sinner anymore. I'm the saint that God wants me to live godly in. So please understand that. You know, we learned this morning, go to Ecclesiastes 9.18, and we're coming to a close here, just a couple more verses. How many of you enjoyed Sunday school today? Man, I know I did. Preached how important it is to our young people to pick the right spouse and how two people working together can honor God in their life and do great works. In fact, we found out in the life of Priscilla and Aquila, or Aquila and Priscilla, as it's mentioned, that God used them to make such a difference for the kingdom of heaven, to be a blessing to Paul, and many souls were one because of their sacrifice. But, but think about the value of one Christian who lives a life of godliness and the difference it makes in this world. We don't See, Satan tells us it's no big deal. You live for self. Please understand that when you sin in your life and live for self, you do more than destroy yourself. You destroy those around you. And you destroy the witness that God wants you to be. Amen. And I understand God's greater than our shortcomings sometimes. We're not perfect people. But we should desire to live perfect lives and be holy unto the Lord. Old Testament said that the priest wore a, a miter on his head. And here were the inscriptions. Holiness to the Lord. God's made us part of that priesthood. We're to be able to walk into that place and minister. Not only for our families, but for those in the world. Do you want your prayers answered, by the way? You have to live a godly life in order for that to happen. God doesn't say just do whatever you want. In fact, He says, God heareth not sinners. I believe that was in my notes here in Romans. But His ears are open to the righteous. It is John 9, 31. Let's go there next. Let's read Ecclesiastes very quickly, verse 19. Look at the power of one sinful person. Ecclesiastes 9.18. This is why we pray so much when we get a president in America. Why? This is why we pray so much for our politicians and leaders. Why? Because one sinner, verse 18, Ecclesiastes 9.18, the Bible says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but what? One sinner destroyeth much good. I've got to live like a saint practically. Because if not, It'll not only destroy the work of God that He did in my life when I got saved, but it'll hurt those around me. It confuses them. That's exactly right. And things need to be clear with the world. We need to live that godly life. Let's go to that verse I mentioned, uh, John 9, 31, please. So, I, you know, Pastor, what are you doing? You're just making me feel bad. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm telling you today how important it is that we live as saints in the practical sense. And if, if you could just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart today and answer to that question, am I a sinner or am I a saint? And as you walk every day and everything that you do in your life, if you could hear those words, am I a sinner or am I a saint? When I reach forth my hand or I look my eyes or I move my feet or I open my mouth, or my thoughts that only God can hear and see, I have to ask myself, am I a sinner or am I a saint? And if you say I'm a saint, then it's time to act practically on what you believe you are today. Because the judgment of God is against sinners. 
And I'll tell you, I believe it breaks God's heart when he has to judge and chasten his children as sinners in the practical sense instead of saints. John 9.31, look at this, talking about getting our answers, prayers answered, John 9.31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. And friend, I want to tell you, you study that out. We've preached on prayer here before. The practical sense, positionally, our prayers are heard because we're saved, but you live a sinful life like Lot, your prayers will not be heard. They will not be answered. And that's a wasted life. Because we got a lot to get done, and the Lord's got a lot to get done with our life. So let me say this. And I, I think this is between you and the Lord. I never try to meddle. And that's why I, I like talking to people about things that's going on in their life. But sometimes I'm like, stop. I don't want to hear any more. Because i got to get up here and preach to you next week. And you're going to think I'm just preaching to you. Because you told me about what you're dealing with. So, so i got to be careful. But our prayers need to be answered, which means we need to understand what practical sainthood or positional application means. That means I'm doing the right thing in my life today. And I'll tell you, when we're praying about something and we don't see our prayers getting answered, we need to say, all right, Lord, what is it in my life? Is there something I'm hiding from you? Is there something I'm keeping back? Is there something I'm not obeying you on? And he'll start bringing some things. And I believe confession is a very important part of our prayer life. It's not, Lord, I'm living my life how I want, and I'm here just to tell you everything I want now. That's how a lot of us pray. We're very selfish, aren't we? But we should desire to please the Lord. Judgment is coming against sinners. The Bible says in Isaiah 13, 9, He shall destroy the sinners out of this world. We need not live like the sinners. Positionally, we're saved if we're born again. We're saints. Practically, we need to live that way. But lastly, I just want to talk about one more thing. And this is a pretty exciting part. One day, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Watch this. You know something else they always said that will help us? And I always think about what we are in Christ, but where we're headed. Heaven has no sin. Heaven has one Savior, and that's our Savior if we're born again today. Do you know what we're going to see? We're going to see the one who died not only to pay for the penalty, which was death of our sin, but also the one who set us free from the power of sin. Last week, we baptized two people. And one of the things that we speak of when we are lifting them up out of the water is that they were buried with Christ unto baptism, that the old man would die, and they're raised to walk in the newness of life. You'll never find anything wrong with what Jesus did for us to set us free. And I want to say this too, and we didn't get all these verses. Jesus never asked us to do anything that he didn't do. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that Jesus was described as a man that was holy, harmless. He was separate from sinners. Never ask us to do anything that he wasn't. And brother, I'll tell you, he was sitting there with those wine bibbers and publicans, which were adulterous people and tax collectors, which we know are sinners. That's a joke. But they were actually thieves. Oh, wait, yeah, okay, never mind. I didn't mean to bring that up. But he was giving them the gospel, but he wasn't participating. And there was a line. And we need to understand there's a line. Amen? But what do we see here? We see... According to Daniel chapter 7, that not only are we positionally need to understand that we're saints, and certainly on a practical sense, my goodness, day by day, but look at this. How about the last point? We are needing to understand that we are possessors of heaven, that God has given and prepared a kingdom, not to sinners, not to sinners. Revelation chapter 21 says, Without our whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all those that love to make a lie, those things that the Bible calls sin. Why do we want to participate and be part of the ungodliness of this world when they're the ones that are without the kingdom of God and the righteous are those that are coming in? We are possessors of this kingdom. Daniel chapter 7. Notice how many times we find this word. Verse number 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. 
verse 22. Until uh, verse number 21, I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Did you know when you study out the Bible that we're going to judge angels? Now, does that make any sense? I mean, we say, we, who likes a hypocrite? And by the way, sometimes that's us. We ought to be like Paul sometimes and say, man, I can't stand myself. I need to get right with God. This is terrible. I can't live like this. I'm not going to do these things. I'm not going to think this way. That's not how Christians are supposed to be. But in heaven, we're going to judge sinners with Jesus. We're going to be there as part of the judgment. Does it make sense that we should participate in sin today? What a hypocrite. We're going to be in heaven. Saints of God, possessors of heaven. Man, Daniel 7 also goes on to say in verse 22 that saints possess the kingdom, and then again in verse 27, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the sinners of the most, saints of the most high, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. All I'm saying to you today is, are you a sinner or are you a saint? Amen. Let's stand for invitation here. Are you a sinner or are you a saint? If, if you're not saved today, you need to be born again. The Bible says you must be born again. You must. Only Jesus Christ can wash away the sin that is against our hearts, the sin that's entered our hearts, the sin that's taken hold of our hearts.